Ah, so, hello, astronomy enthusiasts. Welcome to the East Valley Astronomy Virtual General Meeting, as we do every month. I'm Gordon Rosser, the president of the club. And so, as usual, here's the agenda. We'll do a welcome, some introductions of the club, make sure you remember who everybody is, and then we'll go into club news. Tom Palakis, we all know him, uh, will give a presentation, a member presentation. And... Uh, Nevedita will give the main presentation, and she has something new in store for us where we can all uh, be a part of that presentation if we so desire. So we will uh, get into it. And uh, let's see. And of course, as usual, we all need to live long and prosper. Introductions, I put this screen up all the time, just so y'all remember who the leadership team of the club is. We're still still working at maintaining the club. Uh, in fact, we're now starting to uh, do some board meetings because things are looking better out there as the pandemic concern. And so we're starting to get ready to, to think about what is needed to start um, opening up a little bit. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but at least we want to be ahead of the game and start thinking about it. And of course, at the bottom, the most important member of the club is you. Our next EVAC meeting will be Friday, the 16th of April, usual time, 7.30 p.m. And Richard Hedrick, uh, the CEO of Plane Wave, will be our main presentation. So uh, let's not miss that one. Uh, very popular telescope. So he's going to be talking about that and his newest uh, product. Club news. This is same old slide that I've been showing. All the personal contact events still remain canceled. Member presentation. Anyone gives a, a want to give a member presentation? By all means, let me know. You can you can get a hold of me on the president's link on our web page. Let me know. Uh, member articles. We started a new thing last time where anyone wants to write a short uh, one-page article about whatever is uh, let me know and we'll get you we'll get you in the newsletter. You will be a published astronomer. Meetings are recorded and they're on our website to give it um, give it a day to get on there. Ouch! The Picket Post Trailhead closes at sundown. Picket Post is a, a very popular viewing and dark sky astrophotography site to the east side of Phoenix. And there was a fatal accident up in uh, Utah last year, June of last year. And so the National Park Service has said that all gates have to be closed down and locked at sundown. They'll reopen at, at sunrise. Picket post being one of them. Uh, that means that our weekend viewing and astrophotography that we liked so much, well, the gate's gonna be closed. Now there's still areas around there that you can, uh, uh, you can go to the side of the road, but you will not be able to get into the usual place. We don't know when that's gonna change. Now this is a government um, mandate. So, uh, you know, we don't know when or if this is even going to change, but we'll let y'all know um, monthly meetings. And don't forget the International Dark Sky Week, April 5th to 12th. And in fact, you can go in and, and nose around there in that website that's down at the bottom and see what's going on. You can register too for some things they have going on. This is a great Great presentation, and I encourage oh, hey, everyone. Gordon, Gordon hang yes. on one second. I think um, I think Ray might have wanted to comment on the um, picket post. Oh, okay, Ray. Let me um, let me see if I can get Ray. Hang on a second, Ray. Um, so Ray, you can unmute yourself if you wanted to say something. unless that was a um, inadvertent hand raise. Oh. Well, we're waiting for Wait. a Ray. Oh, uh, OK, so you're, you're muted, Ray. Uh, there you go. 
Did you want to comment, Ray? Okay, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Ray might be wanting to give some uh, latest information about it. I had gone out there last week, I believe it was, and talked to the ranger out there. He has my phone number. Uh, his boss, his boss, his boss have it all. So they have said if there's any changes, they would let me know. But we all have to remember that Picket Post and EVAC, EVAC has nothing really uh, uh, to do with Picket Post. It's, it's, there is no relationship there, no formal relationship besides just goodwill and it's a nice place to be. But there is no official uh, relationship. So uh, anyone can go there. Well, now, you, know, you, you, you can't go there during the night. But it's just not an evac thing. It's anyone can go there. So we'll see how, how that turns out. Now back to this amateur astronomy. This, I recommend that everybody take a look at this. The last one is tomorrow. And it's the art of astrophotography. Um, the Kalamazoo Club, they focus on beginner type of stuff. And I get a lot of questions about how do I get started in astrophotography? Well, this would be a good thing to, to look at. It's about two hours long. Um, even those that are, that are seasoned astrophotographers, take a look because these are the questions too that, that uh, probably people will be asking you as beginners and you'd have a little bit more in your toolbox to answer them. So I encourage everybody, take a look. You have to register if you haven't already. Um, and there's the registration link down there. And uh, remember time change, it was 11 Arizona time, now with the time change you know, and all that nonsense. Oh, it's now 10 o'clock. So member presentation, Tom Palakis. We all know Tom Palakis, a major contributor to the club, and he will be given a presentation on a, uh, a binary companion to an asteroid. So Tom. Hey, sharing my screen now. And I will unshare. Is that showing up for everybody? Looks good. My screen, my screen's showing up. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. That's all I need to know. Okay. So I'm going to talk about an asteroid that I've been observing last month and a little bit into this month and how it got interesting. So I did a talk about photometry at this club about a year and a half ago or two years ago, and. Uh, this may look kind of confusing, but what I do as part of the hobby is very technical. But I make, uh, I do photometry as just measure of brightness of objects. And so this is an asteroid spinning around, rotating over a course of eight nights. And so what I'm doing here then, or seven nights, is taking that and figuring out how long its day is, how long it takes to rotate. So in this case, it's 29.9 hours and you make what's called a light curve. It's called a phased light curve. And from this, you not only know the day, but if you make enough of these at different points in its orbit, you can actually model the shape with some really cool math. So I typically would do like 80 images in a night. The scope's running right now. I actually just started at 7.30 and it just does this under a script. And I've done about 200 of these light curves and had them published in a journal called the Minor Planet Bulletin. So the latest one that I was in the latest batch, I didn't know anything about it other than not much had been published on it. It was 1803 Zwicky, named after the great astronomer Fritz Zwicky and a pretty low numbered asteroid discovered back in the 1930s, I think it was. Um, and, and what you can do is find out how often or how many times in the past the rotational period, the length of its day has been uh, published. And so we can see this one PAL 2020, it's only been, it only was done once and has a lot of significant figures, 2.7 hours is the length of its day. <clears throat> so th this source uses the test satellite, which is a exoplanet discovery and follow up satellite. That's been awesome, you know, for exoplanets, for finding transits of exoplanets across distant stars. But what they did is they did data mining and made almost 10,000 new asteroid light curves based on, on a pipeline that they set up to, to find out uh, where's the asteroid crossing these test frames and we can do photometry and now it's all out there, all this data is out there. Um, so that's what had been published. They got 2.7 hours 
I did four nights of photometry. This is just the photometry of the brightness with error bars for those four nights, around 14 and a half magnitude. And then I got a real similar period, 2.7 hours. <clears throat> but there was something strange in this data on the second night, which is February 22nd. You can see it here, like this dip of what's going on. And I looked and looked at all the images that made up those points and there's nothing wrong with them. It was all good data. So when you put it on this light curve, which shows uh, what happens while it rotates, you also get those points hanging way down below the curve. And I didn't want to get too excited about it. So what I did then was, was right when before I was getting ready to publish these, I said, I can't just kick these points out arbitrarily. So I'll do another night. And that was a week later on March 1st. And so what you see here, that's the asteroid rotating. So each one of those is, is each one of these pairs of peaks and valleys is 2.7 hours, but then something's happening here. There's another, there's this drop in brightness. <clears throat> so after that, I learned um, not only can you look at the paper that made this previously published um, period from the test data, from the satellite data, you could actually look at their, their nearly 10,000 light curves if you wanted to for any of these asteroids that they measured. And here's the light curve that they had for this particular asteroid that gave them that 2.7 hour period. So a 2.7 hour period of rotation is buried in here. And if you took all of those and made a phased curve, you do this Fourier analysis, you'll get a real nice period. Well, what's going on here? So every 0.59 days, you're getting one of these troughs and they're very periodic looking. So what has to be happening when you see that is a second, a companion, a secondary asteroid is passing in front of our, our primary and it's causing what we call mutual events. Um, we see them also at Jupiter satellites and that's uh, eclipses and occultations. So here's what's going on. Uh, just a schematic of it is when you have an eclipse, then you don't have the brightness of both of those individually. Now you're kind of merged in that way you'll get the small trough. And when you get it passing behind an occultation, you'll get a deeper trough. And you'll get two of those for every orbit. And so what I wanted to do was see if I could find both of these and, and measure those. And I already had a couple, like two or three data points as, or three, two or three nights as it was. So let's look at uh, four more nights. Here's that March 1st night that I already showed uh, with the compressed scale, there's that, that event that happened late in that night, like in the morning hours. Nothing happened on March 2nd. March 3rd, I captured just the uh, from the deep eclipse or, or occultation on up to where nothing's happening. And so having these, I was able to make kind of an ephemeris, if you will, that would tell me when's the next one of these gonna happen. And by this point, I knew the next one was gonna happen right when you wanted it to happen at midnight on the very next night. And you wanna get a couple of these eclipses and occultations to get a, a good light curve out of this. So the bad news was that was when we had our last rain in Phoenix and, and we had clouds. So the nice part is that Bob Stevens, who I know fairly well, has an observatory in Yucca Valley or near Yucca Valley, California, 300 miles west of where we are. And I looked closely during the course of that morning at the satellite images and I could tell it was gonna be clear where he was. And just with only four or five hours notice, he pointed his telescope and he does better photometry than I can ever do. And he was able to get those points, which were really key to, to getting everything together. And so this is what we have. If you look at just the uh, test data, again, this is uh, exoplanet sur satellite survey, um, sorry, exoplanet survey. And <clears throat> what you'll see is here's the period of 2.73 hours that, that they had, that they published, but what the people who published it missed was the revolution period that has the occultations and the eclipses just because they probably didn't look at these 10,000 light curves that closely to, to look for these types of events. And so it was in their data, but it's kind of sloppy. You know, it's, it's not sloppy. It just doesn't have enough uh, tight enough resolution and time. Their cadence is about a half an hour between each image. So 
that's not really tight enough and so you end up with a pretty poorly defined minima. But if you take my data and Bob Stevens data for that one night, now you have a really well-defined light curve for rotation. And here's one for revolution that shows occultation and an eclipse. And so that's pretty cool. It's the first time that I've independently discovered a satellite uh, that's doing this um, for an asteroid. And by now there's about 400 and some 420 of these known. Some of them were direct observation. Some of them were radar observations back when Arecibo was a thing, it was observing them. And, um, and then most of them are done this way, but they happen to be oriented the right way and you get uh, eclipses and occultations. And so back to that illustration, <clears throat> what do you, what can you know about the, uh, about the secondary doing the eclipses and occultations on um, that rotation amplitude, which is not this thing, that's the thing that was 2.7 hours. It, it's fairly flat. So that means the asteroid's not very elongated as it rotates. We're not seeing a big change in its aspect. Um, the depth of the eclipses is is sub substantial and from that depth you can kind of bracket what the size what the diameter of the primary of the companion is compared to the primary so this is roughly to scale even though they're not these ideal spheres um, what you also see is that the bottom of the curves there's no flat when i when i showed my light curves they kind of have this u or v or u shape to them and that means that you never have a total eclipse or a complete occultation. So it is kind of like what you see here where you always have some light coming, coming through as it passes behind the, the larger body. So what that leads to, and this is a kind of gratifying part is I've been following these, these used to come out on these little three by five, three and a half by five index cards. Um, this is from the Central Bureau at Harvard University. They've been doing these forever. They, they now call them electronic telegrams. And it has the names of me and Robert Stevens. And this guy, Peter Pravich in the Czech Republic knows how to do this uh, as well as anybody. So he did the final analysis to give all these numbers that you see in here, which, which are better than what I can do with my period searching. Um, so what that leads to, and we're getting toward the end of this, is, uh, well, if, they, if the authors missed that one, even without any observations from my observatory back here, I should be able to do some data mining of my own of their light curves that they didn't notice. And sure enough, here are two out of I'm literally hundreds that I looked at, and I kind of just have to glance at each one that are showing these periodic things. So what you do next is, you can get not just the curve, but you can get their actual raw photometry data, which is all out there for, for the taking, um, bring it into Excel and then bring it into the period analysis software. And here are two more asteroids that have a primary rotation light curve and then eclipses and occultations. And again, since this is taken at a 30 minute cadence from the satellite, it's not real high resolution. So we need follow up observations. And I'm, I've asked a number of prolific asteroid observers um, to have a look. It's, for, it's magnitude 15 isn't bad for our equipment. Um, opposition's coming up in May. Unfortunately, that places it fairly southerly for our latitudes. So there's one of them. Here's the other, I don't really have that much trust that this is correct, this rotation period, but these are definitely mutual events. So here's the second one. This one reaches opposition right when the monsoon gets going here um, and it's only magnitude 17. I've called on somebody in Australia who wants to follow up on this and we're, we'll hope for the best on that. So that one's gonna be a little bit more difficult, but then you have two more uh, discoveries. They're not as interesting as ones from the backyard observatory, but they're unknown up until now. So there's three, three asteroids that have companions. Finally, a little bit about Fritz Zwicky, the genius. He is the person the name the asteroid was named after. They call him the father of dark matter. He's the first person who came up with that as a concept. He yeah, first came up with supernovae as a concept and postulated neutron stars. And if you've read anything about Fritz Zwicky, he's quite the character, um, not always in the best way. Um, one time he had a student shoot a bullet into the air over Mount Wilson in an attempt to improve seeing. Um, this is one of his quotes here. 
and, and a term that's actually in the urban dictionary now is spherical bastards, which are bastards when they're looked at from any angle, from any side. So that's Fritz Zwicky. That was also fun that it happened to be named after him. And that's my binary asteroid discovery. I hope I didn't go too far over 10 minutes. Thanks. I'm going to stop the share now. All right. Tom, thanks a lot. Uh, as usual, wow, what a great presentation and something uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, we can all um, learn about that what goes on kind of behind the scenes. Right? Hey, hey, Gordon, we do have a couple of uh, questions for Tom. Ah, good. Okay. Uh, one of them, he was saying he needed more time to read slide number 13. Okay. <laughs> good I stuff. If we have time, then I can do that. But let's come back to that if we get the, if the other two are easy to answer. I'm just I'm looking at the Q and A now. Okay, Tom. go ahead. Um, and I just have occultation by asteroid. <clears throat> yes, there. So so Joan Dunham, Joan Dunham, uh, wife of David Dunham, um, and there's nobody who knows more about occultations in the world than David Dunham, who is at our club meetings routinely. Um, she's pointing out that. This is another way that, that binary asteroids are discovered that I failed to mention is that you watch an asteroid pass in front of a star from enough locations, enough geographic locations on Earth, and you can infer its shape. And a lot of times that actually is a great way to verify these shape models that you get from photometry, but it appears that this asteroid 8 flora um, might have a small companion because there would be a gap where your star comes back and then it goes back out again as it goes behind the secondary. So that's pretty cool. Um, if I have time, I'll just really quickly see if I can remember what slide 13 is here. <laughs> um, yeah, that's one good stuff. All right. Yeah, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Going Tom. back to slide 13. Where is this share screen? I'm panicking now. All right, there it is. Share screen. And we go to that and we go back to. 13. Oh, 13 was just, uh, this is just the announcement. So from Harvard University has been doing this for 50 years, probably longer. Uh, they make they make announcements of transient events. If there's a supernova or a comet discovery, or in this case, something interesting about an asteroid, and it just needs an announcement before it's put into a major journal. Um, you write these uh, announcements that are pretty formal, and then they go out to, to all the observatories or anybody who subscribes to them. So they call them electronic telegrams. And there's, there's too much detail on here to get into in the next minute or two, but that's, I, I can give you access to that, or I can just paste it into a, into a window here. Actually, I'll do that while the meeting's going on, so I can read it there. Okay. Yeah, and everybody remember that uh, this is being recorded, so they can also go into our website. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you had one last one, Tom, from Bill Peters. Oh, remind us of the name of the journal that picked up your news. Um, so that again, oh, the, the journal that I published these light curves in is, uh, it's mostly amateurs who contribute to it. It's just called the Minor Planet Bulletin. But it is in the, at the ADS, which is a searchable index of journals. Um, so you can see them there. Uh, that, what I just showed, that slide 13, is the way it was announced. And the third person on that, Peter Pravich, actually wrote the CBT announcement because he knows he's done this a lot of times and he's real experienced with it. And those will just fly through, they'll accept those right away. And one, one last one there. Well, Peters, will you be observing near-Earth asteroid tonight or tomorrow? Um, no, I mean, it's interesting and all, but it's, I get locked in on this. You, you love these long runs of clear nights we get in Arizona, and, and I need continuity on the three asteroids that I'm currently following. So it kind of blocks me out for entire nights where I need a second telescope if I'm going to do stuff like that, and then that, that ain't going to happen. So that's where that is. Okay. Okay. Thanks, All right. Tom. Again, Tom Palakis, thank you. Uh, great presentation again on how there are other things that people can get into in astronomy. So Thomas Mosden, 
I will hand it over to you for our main presentation. All right, thanks, Gordon. It's uh, my privilege to introduce our featured speaker today, uh, Navidita Mahesh. She's a graduate researcher in the Low Frequency Cosmology Lab at ASU with a main research focus in early universe cosmology, working under Professor Judd Bowman. And with an electrical engineering master's degree and background in antennas and electricity and magnetism, She's involved in antenna design and instrument calibration for radio astronomy at Arizona State University. She gained experience in 21 centimeter power spectrum analysis and imaging using LOFAR data. And LOFAR is the um, low frequency radio telescope array that's based in the Netherlands and has satellite locations all throughout Northern Europe of all places. Um, they, they somehow work with radio frequency interference um, mitigation techniques and do some pretty good science there. Anyway, um, in 2019, Nevada won a prestigious NASA finest grant. Um, she may explain what finest stands for. <laughs> She'll develop um, new technologies to enable radio telescopes on the moon in order to study the cosmological dark ages and the magnetic fields of exoplanets. It was uh, pretty tough to win that award. Um, so when she's not analyzing low frequency antennas for early universe cosmology, she likes to perform classical Indian dancing. <laughs> she's a trained Indian classical dancer with 20 years of experience and uh, co-founder of the Indian classical team at Arizona State University. And maybe when we get back to in-person events, uh, you could come out and uh, see her dance. But it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Nivedita. Please uh, take it away, Nivedita. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for that kind introduction. Also, thank you to the entire member committee members of EWAC for giving me this opportunity to talk to this wonderful audience. I will now share my screen. Um, I'm guessing you can see my screen okay. Uh, also, uh, as uh, mentioned before, I have a little interactive component with my talk. Uh, I'm guessing Tom will paste the link as to how you can interact with my slides. And when they come up, I will just remind you of that interactive component. So, uh, uh, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be, like Tom mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the far side a radio telescope that's going to go behind, behind the moon. And um, my primary advisor is Judd Bowman. And this work is supported by the FINIST Award from NASA. FINIST stands for Future Investigators in NASA's Earth, Space, Science and Technology. Um, so this work is supported by that. Okay, so let's just get started. So far side, uh, what does our far side for stand for? Let me make a note that astronomers are not well known uh, for acronyms. So far side does have the far side in its name. It's a far side array for radio science investigations of the dark ages and exoplanets. Uh, it's a probe class mission already funded by NASA to place a radio array on the backside of the moon. It is definitely a big mission, a big project involving a huge collaboration, starting off with a group that we call ourselves as Network of, for Exploration and Space Science. Uh, in this group, there are a lot of PIs and professors from different universities like Boulder, uh, Caltech, ASU, UCLA, and Brown University. And from ASU, it's Judd Bowman, and that's where I come into picture. Uh, we also have a team from Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, they are the Team X and completely responsible for the hardware side of uh, the far side in terms of uh, design, integration, and testing. JPL will be responsible. And finally, we have Blue Origin, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos' company in Seattle. Uh, we rely on them for the commercial lander. Okay, so how uh, Farsight was inspired by our, uh, NASA's plans to go back to the moon through its Artemis uh, program, which is after Ap Apollo mission, NASA is now going back to the moon, taking astronauts back. And what I, for me, what's the cake, uh, icing on the cake is that we're gonna take the first woman astronaut to the moon. Um, so through the Artemis program, NASA has uh, solicited applications from commercial space agencies called the Commercial Lunar Payload Services, and it's encouraged 
um, commercial space agencies to uh, send in their payloads, which is where Farsight is going to piggy bank on the Blue Origin space mission. Now, Artemis's phase one uh, proposal is going to be launched by 2024. And once we have already tested and launched um, to the moon, after that, in the phase two, after the technology has been tested, is where uh, Farsight will come into play. Okay, so with that background about Farsight, this will be my outline for the talk for tonight. Uh, so first, we will identify the science cases that Farsight is going for, the requirements of the mission, uh, we will focus a little bit on the design of antennas because that's where one of my first contributions came in. And then the mission concept of our site, we will then discuss the array layout and the polarization of the array, my second contribution to far side, and the communication, um, how are we going to communicate to the far side, and some launch aspects and to final discussions. So compelling astrophysics, this is why we're going to the moon. There are two compelling astrophysical questions that can uniquely be answered using low frequencies from the moon. One of which is some exoplanet study. Second is hydrogen cosmology. Let's look at that in detail. So for the science case one, in terms of exoplanet study, what are we actually going to study? So we're going to look for radio waves from the host star and the planet. So, so shown here is an artist rendition of a host star, M dwarf host star and its planet. Now, M dwarfs are known to have violent activities where they produce CME shocks, the coronal mass ejections. And when they produce coronal mass ejection, they also emit radio bursts. Thus, we can study the stellar activity. We can study the stellar wind by looking at radio waves. Next, in terms of the planet, these coronal mass ejections uh, are once they leave the star, they come in traction with in uh, with the planet, uh, with the magnetosphere of the planet, and they produce radio waves or the auroral radio emission. Thus, we can study the planet's magnetic field. We can also study the dynamo inside the planet. So, using radio bursts from the star, we study the star, and using radio emission from the planet, we also study properties of the planet. Now, here's a fun simulation by Chuck Carter at Caltech. Uh, shown on the right and the left is an M dwarf, now going to eject coronal mass ejections. And the coronal mass ejection interact with two separate scenarios of planets on the left and the right. And I'll just, yeah, you can see it, it interacts with two different set of planets, one on the left and one on the right. And here is where I have our first interactive component. Um, I'm hoping uh, people have access to that link. If not, the link is on the top of my slide. Uh, if you could type it into any of uh, available el electronic devices. The question is, I showed you a simulation where the star let out CMEs and it interacted with two different scenarios of the planets. In that simulation, what did you notice to be the difference between the right and the left? I'm going to give it a minute for people to get the link activated. Reflection of the exoplanet. Mm -hmm. There seems to be little interaction with the planet on the left. Yes, nothing happened on the left versus radiation is reflected on the right. Yes, magnetic fields, wonderful. Left, the planet has no magnetic field, yes. Yes, wonderful. Yeah, so one has a, oh, wow, okay, <laughs> there we go. So we had the magnetic protection. Wow, okay, my next slide was pretty much, is pretty much answered at this point. So y'all are right. On the left, we saw little interaction. On the right, we saw more interaction. On the right, we saw more radio waves or uh, reflection. That was the radio waves. And like, right, well, one of y'all pointed out, a few of y'all actually pointed out, there was magnetic field on the right. And that magnetic field indeed protects an atmosphere inside the planet. So with far side, we're actually going to be answering one of the most profound questions, right? So if we see radio waves from an extra exoplanet, it means it has a magnetic field. It means it's protecting an atmosphere within it. It means it could be habitable. So therefore, we're going to answer one of the most profound questions with Farsight. So 
I've been telling you we're going to use radio waves, but what frequencies are we going to look at? What frequencies should Farsight be designed for? For that, let's just uh, understand the mechanism of what produces these radio waves. It is definitely magnetic field, like we understood, and the emission is produced due to electron cyclotron maze um, emission. And it depends on the magnetic field. It's directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field associated. Now, such emission is already seen in our solar system from planets in our solar system, shown in this figure on the left. This is frequency versus flux. And this is radio emission from Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, and Uranus. So we've seen this radio emission. And we, I want to highlight that we see these radio emissions at frequencies below 10 megahertz. So this gives us an idea of which frequencies to look for. So this is in terms of our solar system, but what about where to expect these flux from the exoplanets? So we have not essentially seen radio flux, maybe one or two papers have been published recently about radio emission from exoplanets. But so what I'm showing you here is a simulation. I took a list of known exoplanets from a list from 2007. We know their magnetic field, and then I estimate the radio flux that we can expect from these exoplanets and at what frequencies. So here, this is frequency versus radio flux from a list of known exoplanets. And as you can see, even for these exoplanets, most of the flux is below 30 megahertz. So this gives us an idea that we should design Farsight to be at frequencies below 30 megahertz. So now for the science case too, I said we're gonna look for hydrogen cosmology. What do I mean by that? For that, let's understand the universe timeline, its evolution, and the observations we have carried out so far. So shown here is a picture of the universe evolution or the universe timeline. Uh, on the x-axis is your time, starting from Big Bang till the present day. And so in terms of the universe evolution, so we have studied epochs such as when the very first light was emitted from the universe, like the CMB, or we know it as the epoch of recombination. So it's the it's the period in the universe when the very first light was produced. So that period is very well studied with the COBE, WMAP, and Planck missions. So after that, in the universe, it is a period of dark ages when nothing really interesting happened. Hydrogen, which happens to be a very first element in our periodic table, just existed in the universe, essentially. That's what was there in dark ages. And then, the, then, comes the first stars, when the first stars ignited, that was the cosmic dawn. And then the first stars evolved, they died. We call that epoch as epoch of reionization in the universe. Epoch of reionization, again, is quite well studied with these telescopes, such as JWST, WFIRST, LOFAR, like Tom mentioned, the telescope in Netherlands, SKA, ERA, and EDGES. So edges I would like to highlight because it's another collaboration I'm involved in at ASU and so is Tom, even he worked on the edges instrument in Western Australia. So we, these telescopes do study the period when the first, time, first stars were evolving. And then the period after that, when all the galaxies formed, stars formed, solar, system, uh, solar systems all around the universe formed, has been very well studied with a number of telescopes. But in this universe timeline, when I mentioned dark ages and sort of the cosmic dawn, I didn't tell you any observation exists because there is none. We haven't studied the dark ages or experimentally studied the dark ages and the beginning of the cosmic dawn, which is where far side can come into play. We can use far side to study these epochs and I'll tell you how. First, let's see a quick, interesting simulation of the universe. Uh, this is a three-dimensional cube of the universe, uh, and it starts off dark, which is just black areas, which is where just hydrogen just exists. That is the dark ages. As the video is playing, we are traveling through time and evolution of the universe. The first stars, uh, stars uh, start to ignite, and they interact with the surrounding hydrogen. They uh, reionize the hydrogen, and that's, how, that's what we show in the simulation as bright spots. So the blue bright spots, the center of which first starts are starting to ignite. And the black spots are now slowly um, reducing because 
all the neutral hydrogen is getting converted to ionized hydrogen. So we are moving from dark ages to the epoch of reionization. That is when nothing existed, just hydrogen existed to when the first stars were formed. So I said, uh, far side uh, can actually study the dark ages. How? We're gonna use hydrogen as a probe. Because like I said, in dark ages, we have plenty of hydrogen. Uh, so how are we going to use as a probe to understand that? Let's look at the atomic structure of hydrogen. Uh, showing you here is its nucleus and the single electron revolving around it. Uh, the arrows indicate the spin axis of the nucleus and the electron respectively. So hyd when hydrogen it has its both spin axis aligned, it, has, it is at one energy state. And the minute one of the spin axis, electron spin axis, anti-aligns with the nucleus spin axis, it's at a different energy state, thereby emitting radiation, which corresponds to 1,420 megahertz or 1.4 gigahertz. So this is a characteristic signature of neutral hydrogen. And we will use this signature, which is abundant in dark ages, to study it via far side. So we're going to use hydrogen from uh, far side, uh, uh, from dark ages to study the dark, dark ages itself. Um, here I have another question for you all. So I told you that the hydrogen char characteristic emission is 1.4 gigahertz, but based on science case one, I justified that we should design Farsight to be an instrument uh, sensitive to below 30 megahertz. So how are we gonna look at the signal then? How does this make sense? Redshift, oh wow. Stretching out, yes. I'm going to give it just a few more seconds to see if anybody else wants to say anything. But we have redshift and stretching out that. That is absolutely right. Um, so the, uh, the 1.4 gigahertz from hydrogen is, in, uh, is now present. But if I'm going to look at the 1.4 gigahertz from dark ages, it has to travel easily 13 billion years to me. And the universe is expanding. Let's not forget that. So, uh, thank you. As I was saying, expanding someone type. Thank you. Um, so the, as the universe expands, this signal, that's 1.4 gigahertz, gets stretched. And if it gets stretched, it falls into lower frequencies. And if we do the exact calculations, um, the 1.4 gigahertz from dark ages falls into frequency ranges below 40 megahertz. And that's far side, far side comes into play. So this is the interesting questions in cosmology that we can answer through far side. So I said, we are going to look at this uh, hydrogen 21 centimeter line uh, to study the dark ages. But what is a measurable quantity? Usually in 21 centimeter, when we use hydrogen, the measurable quantity is the temperature associated with it. So um, also to give you all a picture, um, so the dark ages, the hydrogen from the dark ages, when we look at it, when we look at its temperature, it is, let's not forget, it's backlit by the first light or the cosmic microwave background. So cosmic microwave background or the very first light happened first in the universe and then the age of the dark ages, right? So when I'm looking at the temperature of this hydrogen, I'm going to look at its temperature contrasted with the first light. So therefore, this is what I'm showing you in this plot here. It's the differential brightness temperature associated with the hydrogen signal against frequency. And like all of you all mentioned, um, since, with frequent, since the expansion of the universe stretches the signal, uh, as we go lower and lower in frequency, as we have stretched more and more, it means we're going further back in time. So lower frequencies back in time. So the lower frequencies uh, probe the dark ages and little forward, higher frequencies probe the cosmic dawn or the very first stars were formed. Um, now shown here, I have shown you a couple of different curves. All of these are different simulations um, of how, what can we expect now, these different simulations, uh, we have taken few different conditions in the early universe, like, you know, different uh, baryonic temperature, different densities, and they produce char characteristically different signals. And especially so in the dark ages versus in the, in the cosmic dawn time. Because if you see around this area, those three signals are almost indistinguishable. There's some degeneracy. But 
in dark ages, if we probe the signal in the dark ages, we can differentiate which cosmological constraints or priors we put in make sense, right? So it's important. It's it's because. Uh, this signal, we have, like I said, experiments like edges on the ground looking at it, but it's important to probe the signal, even the dark ages, because we are curious what dark ages is like. Also, this will give us an uh, information that which cosmological model actually works, which parameters of the cosmological model actually works. So it's a great, it's a really interesting question for the cosmologist. Okay, so now we have justified that uh, uh, we need far side to operate at frequencies below 30 megahertz for exoplanet and uh, the hydrogen cosmology. My next question is to figure out where should we place far side? Uh, the, the way we think, the way the mission uh, collaborators thought about it is the first question we asked ourselves, at what frequencies does our ionosphere become opaque? Is it at 300 kilohertz, 30 megahertz or 300 megahertz? We have one answer or a couple answers saying 300 megahertz so far. Okay. okay. Now we have a majority saying 30 megahertz. I'm going to give it a, okay. I guess people think it's 30 megahertz now. It's really interesting seeing the graphs go up and down. Uh, so y'all are right right now. Uh, the majority of you are right that it's definitely 30 megahertz. And uh, if it were 300 megahertz, most of our radio telescopes won't be on the ground, right? So we have, for example, EDGES itself, that other collaboration we're working with, operates from 50 to 100 megahertz and we are on the ground. LOFAR also operates at frequencies below 100 megahertz and it's on the ground. So all of these uh, telescopes are on the ground and we can see the sky. So that means the ionosphere, the ionosphere does have effects to come, also to point out that if someone were thinking of that and hence saying 300 megahertz, it does have effects that will interfere with our data uh, at below 100 megahertz itself, but it's not opaque. Below 30 megahertz, it actually becomes opaque. We really can't see anything. And that's the reason why far side needs to go out of out of our atmosphere. So with that, hence space. Um, but now the next question is, it could be anywhere in space, right? So the next question we asked ourselves is what's the most radio quiet zone in the inner solar system? What do you think is the most? Oh, this, sorry, there we go. Behind the moon, yeah. I did give the punchline by saying this is the far side mission anyways. But yeah, let's think why. Why is just the behind the moon the most radio quiet zone? Why can't we be on the near side of the moon? Oops. I don't want an update. I just, ah, there we go. Uh, so you're right, far side, but why? Uh, so few of, we can refer to few of NASA's previous mission to answer this question. First, let's look at this dynamic plot on the bottom left. Uh, this was taken by the wind, wind waves mission from in 1999. This mission was actually sent to the Lagrange point one, which is beyond our moon, right? And, and here we have a dynamic spectrum that is time versus frequency. And even at that distance, at certain frequencies, do you see these in intense uh, RFI, radio frequency interferences at all times, those are still our terrestrial transmitters. So we are still seeing terrestrial transmitters at quite high intensities. Also seen in this are vertical lines, which is due to our sun's birds. So it's not enough to just go far away. And then there's this plot. Um, this was also taken by one of NASA's mission, which is the NASA RAE2. Um, where it flew an orbiter around the moon and it did take measurements on the near side and the far side at quite a few different frequencies. These frequencies are at megahertz. Uh, so this is intensity versus time. And as and you can see, every time the uh, orbiter was near the near side, there's still so much noise. And the minute it goes to the far side, the minute it reaches that immersion level, you reach ambient noise. It's brilliant. 
at this point, I also wanted to highlight the reason we are so concerned about Harafai is because for both the science cases, the exoplanet and the cosmology, the hydrogen signal, uh, really a weak especially the hydrogen signal, because we're looking at a signal that's like 13 billion years old. It's gonna be extremely weak. So we wanna get away from any RFI as possible. And also the expected flux from the exoplanets is not very strong. Okay. So uh, now that we know, we, we're all convinced uh, that the far side makes sense for the science cases we're looking for. Um, let's look at, uh, how we are selecting the mission site. So this uh, was a set of simulations carried out by my colleague at CU Boulder, Neil Bassett. Um, he carried out a set of uh, electrodynamic simulations. He simulated the moon um, as shown here on the left. He simulated the moon. He sent in some radio waves and he tried to measure what is the attenuation level on the far side. And he uh, uh, arrived to the conclusion that in this plot, we are flattening out the moon. So it's the entire 360 degree uh, and 180 degrees, which is flatted down the moon. And he arrived to a conclusion that we can place far side um, plus or minus 45 degree from the equator uh, around the anti point and plus or minus 60 degree around the zero long long longitude. So um, and over there, we can get maximum attenuation from any of the terrestrial transmitters. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the requirements of the mission, uh, we wanted low frequencies because of the science case. So we have, we have to avoid the ionosphere. And we don't want RFI, so we better go to the backside of the moon. Um, the other few other requirements are we want large collecting area. Because like I said, the signal is really weak. So we want a large collecting area. and for the exoplanet studies, the, the radio emission from the planets occur when uh, the host star has the CMEs, right, the shock waves. And those shock waves are irregular. They're not periodic. They're not pre predictable. So they're random. So it's important to look at thousands of systems on the sky simultaneously so that we don't miss any of these radio emissions. Hence, we need an array. We don't need one telescope. We need an array of telescopes placed on the surface. Okay, so now here is uh, let's, uh, my first question or my first contribution to uh, Farsai was what is the what can be the most optimal antenna design, right? Um, before we go there, let me. Uh, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked myself when I started this uh, project: Why can't we use existing dipoles or antennas already developed on Earth? Why do we need to have specific study of antennas or dipoles to be placed on the moon. I miss for blocking. Mm -hmm. Gain, okay, uh, weak gain. Mm -hmm. Like, so I see weak gain, and then I see something about magnetic field. And I also saw ionosphere, one of the first things. Okay, so we, so we see magnetic field, and I'm guessing weak gain. Um, I'm guessing y'all are on the same line of thought. Uh, so one, I like the answer of the ionosphere, right? So it's true that because we have the ionosphere effects, we have never designed an uh, antenna or a radio antenna for frequencies below 30 megahertz, right? Because we cannot do it on the ground, right? Um, second, radio antennas depend on the environment so much. Like if you place your radio antenna on the soil, the soil properties will affect your gain, antenna's gain a lot. So with that in mind, existing antennas cannot be uh, use, they have to be redesigned because we have never used a radio telescope, sensitive radio telescope, less than 30 megahertz. Second, we have to optimize the gain for the regolith, the lunar surface properties. So how did I go about this study? I started off with an antenna that I know and love, the EDGES blade antenna. EDGES is that instrument in Western Australia that I also study for my thesis. 
Um, so since I've studied edges in detail uh, and I know its properties and I know it's been optimized for uh, hydrogen cosmology, uh, we start off there. So the way I study its properties is simulating in an electromagnetic, uh, electron EM software, electromagnetic software like FICO. So this is a picture of the edges blade antenna. The two steel plates on top are the actual antenna elements, uh, which is just supported by a structure. And this mesh sort of thing you can see below is actually the ground plane for the antenna. Um, and this exact structure is uh, simulated in the FICO model. So this small thing is actually that shiny metal surface and that big rectangle you can see, oh, it's actually a square, uh, big square that you can see below is the ground plane corresponding to this mesh. And below that, like I said, the soil matters. So I also simulate the properties of the MRO soil, which is the MRO is the site where edges is. I actually simulate the properties of the soil to study the antenna's gain perfectly. So we start off there. And what we do is now, the, I try out six different configurations. The way I go about that is I take the exact same antenna dimensions and instead of the Himar or soil, I now use the lunar regolith, the lunar soil properties that we know from the Apollo missions. And then I ask myself, okay, so we're gonna put an array of antennas. We're not gonna put one antenna, right? So we're gonna put an array of these dipoles. And if each of these dipoles require a ground plane, the deployment is not gonna be easy. Right, So we're going to test the antenna, just use the blade, the blade that you see on top, just put that straight on the ground, avoid the ground plane. We want to see if this makes sense, if the properties make sense. And then the next thing we do is, of course, whenever you place the antenna directly on the soil, it's going to interfere with the properties of the soil. So we thought, okay, let's lift it by 10 centimeters and see if that is essential. Uh, and then uh, also to note, the edges experiment antenna design is optimized for frequency ranges from 50 to 100 megahertz. And we definitely want to go at much lower frequencies. The lower the frequency you go, the bigger the antenna size has to be. So I just double my, uh, I this configuration five is same as configuration three, but I've doubled the size of the antenna. So it's still on the ground. Configuration six is similar to con configuration four, but the double the size of the antenna and 10 centimeters above. Now I have simulated so uh, different configuration, but we have to ask the question, how are we going to test the effectiveness of these antennas? The first effectiveness test we're going to look at is how much power goes through the antenna. And that can be answered by the gain or the beam pattern of the antenna. So showing you here, uh, the beam patterns of the antenna at one particular frequency versus viewing angle versus different thetas on the sky. Uh, the top one is a cross section along the excitation of the antenna. The bottom is perpendicular to the excitation axis of the antenna. Uh, now, as you can see, the first thing that stands out is, oh, the black curve has the best gain. Of course, it has the best gain because that's the model that has the ground plane. Um, the remaining curves that are squished and has lower gain is where we removed the ground plane. So we are definitely going to compromise on the gain of the antenna, which is fine. One thing we were worried about if we remove the ground plane is will the beam pattern look funky? It doesn't, which is really promising. We, so we can definitely use the dipoles straight on the ground. We might lose gain, which is okay, but there's nothing funky going on. Uh, also shown here is another plot to visualize the beam. So this is the beam versus frequency for one point on the beam. So it's like on so the beam is a three-dimensional pattern. We're just taking the zenith of the beam and we're pl plotting it against frequency. Um, yet again, uh, you can see that the black definitely has a better gain. Uh, that's because we have the ground plane. The minute you take off the ground plane, the gain reduces, which is fine. And here, the, uh, we made another um, decision here. So the blue curve has lower gain than the red curve at the frequencies we are interested in. And you know what the red curve is those configurations where we increase the size, which makes sense. So we're going lower in frequencies. It'll have better gain if you increase its size. The next effectiveness uh, test too that we do is how much power reaches the electronics. So this much, the gain helps, helps to give us the information that um, how much power goes through the antenna. Uh, 
the reflection coefficient of an antenna tells you how much power goes into the electronics and uh, rather we don't want too much power getting reflected back. So for that, uh, we measure it using a, a parameter called S11. So the lower, the more negative your S11 is, more power will go through the electronics. And so more negative S11 is better. Um, again, this is frequency versus S11. Again, the, the curve that has the most negative value is the black curve because it has the ground plane. Um, but even though if we take away the ground plane, it's not so bad. So ideally when we uh, design antennas, we like any, any S11 uh, lesser than minus 10 is good. Um, so keeping that in mind, the red curve has better um, S11 response at frequency we're interested in again. Because again, the red curve is the configurations without the ground plane, yes, but it's been uh, made larger to support the frequency range we are interested in. So now we combine both the terms. We have seen the gain and we have seen the S11. If you combine both, it can give you a complete information of how much power goes through the receiver. So the six configuration, for the six configuration, I calculated how much power goes to the receiver at 10 megahertz and at 40 megahertz. Um, to remind you, the first configuration is actually the edges antenna in the MRO soil. Second configuration is uh, taking, taking the edges antenna with the ground plane and placing it on the lunar surface. The third and the fourth is removing the ground plane and placing it on the ground or at 10 centimeters above. Five and six is similar to three and four, but we have doubled the size. Um, and so we have these numbers. We have to make a decision on which configurations make sense. Um, also to note, when you make this decision, um, the noise power of an instrument is always roughly to uh, expected to be about 250 Kelvin. So all these numbers I've given you are in Kelvin and the noise power of an instrument is expected to be 250 Kelvin. Given that, I will ask you the question, which configuration can we use? E, we have a response E. So we have some people saying configuration five and some people saying configuration six. We do have few people saying configuration one. So the majority still says configuration five, which is actually right. So configuration five is what we have decided on. Uh, so in terms of just to go over it, in terms of configuration one, it's not feasible, right? So I simulated configuration one using the Australian soil properties, which is not feasible. But uh, between five and six, it's a fair confusion. Um, both of them, as you can see, uh, at 10 megahertz, both of them give us enough power greater than the noise power. Even at 40 megahertz, they give us enough power greater than noise power. The reason configuration five makes more sense is because configuration five, like I told you, I doubled the size of the antenna, but I placed it straight on the ground. In configuration six, I increased this, this distance between the ground and the antenna by 10 centimeters. And it becomes a very mission or a deployment strategy if trying to increase the size of uh, a place or levitate or place the dipoles above the ground becomes cumbersome. Right? It's a more a uh, design strategy where we were like, okay, configuration five is easier for deployment. Uh, otherwise five and six both works. Whereas the rest of them give us lower power than the noise power at 10 megahertz. So you all are right. So yeah, just to conclude that, yeah, uh, the config to receive, uh, to have a signal to noise ratio, that is a uh, signal to noise ratio greater than one at 10 megahertz, we definitely either need configuration five or six. We don't need uh, ground plane, which was a big, uh, giving that result to JPL, they were really happy. Knowing that we can use dipoles without ground planes is a big deal because imagine deploying 200 dipoles with ground planes, it's a big hassle. Um, but the other thing we said is yes, uh, if you wanted to use a dipole, it has to be uh, a big dipole because uh, it has to be sensitive to low frequencies and it can be straight on the ground. You don't have to raise it up by a few centimeters. So just summarizing the antenna study, no need to include a ground plane, can use simple dipoles. Uh, the antenna must be at least twice the size of the edges dipole for reference. Uh, 
Now, in terms of future work, uh, when I model the soil of the lunar regolith, I used a constant property with depth, okay? But from the Apollo mission, we know that the lunar regolith properties changes with depth. And like I told you, soil matters a lot to the antennas gain. So my next work is to see uh, if I vary in my simulations, if I vary the electrical properties of the soil with depth, how does the gain of the ant antenna vary? Now with this, uh, the, let's look at the far side mission concept. Uh, we have finally decided that we will do a frequency range of 100 kilohertz to 40 megahertz. Um, this is how the mission will look like. There will be a lander, uh, mostly provided by uh, uh, Blue Origin. It will have a base station. The base station will have an eye gain antenna that will provide the communication. The base station will also pro provide uh, data processing and the power. Uh, from the base station, the rover will roll out. Um, Showing you here is the rover. And the rover will have these tether wheels, which will deploy these tethers. And at certain distance of the tethers, the antenna nodes will be deployed. So this is how it will look. And here there's a fun simulation by Michael Walker at CU Boulder, who shows you how this is going to be. So that's our lander, which has the base station inside. The rover is sliding down the lander. Uh, you can also see the high gain antenna here. Um, and it's pulling out a tether, a better viewing angle. So this yellow patch is our tether. And it deployed a node. From the node, you will see dipoles getting engaged. And this is how the concept, this is the far side mission concept. Okay, so what does the layout, array layout look like? I said it's gonna be an array of dipoles. What is it gonna look like? Uh, so the array is gonna extend 10 kilometers. Uh, this is gonna be the base station from where the rover will deploy this petal configuration. And these red dots are the antenna nodes from where the dipoles will get engaged. Uh, now zooming in to this, how the dipoles are gonna look like. Uh, so the rover is gonna go zigzag. Um, why? Because in the radio array, we need uh, two dipoles at each antenna nodes. We want orthogonal dipoles so that we can get complete polarization information of the source. So we need orthogonal dipoles. Uh, so the way it's going to deploy the orthogonal dipoles is that it's going to deploy this tether, which is just blank. The small vertical line, if you see the vertical correspondence of the yellow, beneath that, there's going to be one dipole. At the center of that, there's going to be the blue perpendicular dipole. So there's a dipole in this, and there's a dipole perpendicular to this. Then it will go a little further and deploy the next antenna node. So showing you inside, uh, so this blue thing, uh, blue dipoles are going to, uh, the, the proposal was to uh, deploy it using stasers. So we're showing you the stasers through which uh, the antenna, perpendicular antennas will get deployed. Below this yellow uh, stas uh, tether, there's already another antenna. And in the center, there is a radioisotope heating unit because the lunar nights are really cold. Now, this is the far side notional layout. It will have about 128 antenna pairs. So 128 antenna nodes. With each node, there is two orthogonal antennas. So totally, there's actually 256 antennas, but we consider the orthogonal as one unit. Um, and another logical uh, constraint is that the stasers the, that actually extend the antenna out cannot deploy two long antennas. They have to be small. So we're going to give the high band antenna to the stasers and the low band antenna, which will be large, which will actually be 100 meters long, will get embedded in the stasers. So the embedded stasers, uh, embedded uh, antennas in the tethers are the low band antenna, and the blue nodes that deployed with stasers will be the high band antenna. Now, the two orthogonal antenna, as you can see, are going to be operating in slightly different frequency ranges. The low band will be at 100 kilohertz to 2 megahertz, and the high band 1 megahertz to 40 megahertz. So just very little overlap between the low band antenna and the high band antenna. And that leads to some disadvantages. Like, because these two have different frequency ranges, uh, they will have limited dual polarization measurement, limited circular polarization data, and longer integration time, because there's no overlap. This is where um, the 
we thought about it and we said, so Jod and I had uh, thought about these constraints. Um, we proposed to uh, JPL that we work on an improved layout. And so this is what our improved layout is. I'm just telling you, it's the mission thought of that four petal layout first, but it had its own disadvantages and we proposed a new layout. So now in this new layout, we still have the base station, but we have four rovers and they're gonna put the antennas in spiral configuration. This time, it's going to deploy the two orthogonal antennas like by shifted. So it's gonna put one underneath the stays, uh, underneath the tether, it's gonna turn 90 degrees, it's gonna put the other one also underneath the tether. So both these antennas can still be the long arm antennas, they're orthogonal, but they're gonna be phase shifted. They're not gonna have the same center. Um, with this improved layout, my question is, what do you think are the advantages of this improved layout? Oops. I'm gonna let this. Um, oh, let me show responses. Oh wow, okay. I don't know why it's not. Trying. What's a talk without some technical difficulties on Zoom? Uh, oh, there we go. Dual polarization. Yes, thank you. Better game. Yes, yes, that's a good point. Yeah, broadband polarization measurement. Yes. More overlap for high band, low band, yes. Easy, oh wow, thank you, yes. Easier deployment indeed. Redundancy, wonderful. Less material, uh, less chance of failure, true, true. Directionality, that's a good point actually, yeah. This seems simpler, indeed, dual polarization. Wonderful, less complex, yes, okay. Yeah, easier deployment. Yep. Yeah. And, I, and you're right. So one of few of the advantage, disadvantages that I mentioned earlier definitely become advantages like you all mentioned. We have more dual polarization data, circular polarization. Uh, I will tell you why, especially for exoplanet, lesser in integration time because there's more overlap. You're absolutely right. And then I'm also pleased that a few of you all mentioned in terms of deployment, because now that we have four rovers instead of one, in case one fails, we don't have to abandon the mission. Uh, and also, like someone else mentioned, the material in terms of deploying the antenna is now distributed between the four. So it's also easier deployment. And uh, easy of deployment, I don't know if anybody uh, um, you're meant that, but no stasers is a big bonus because NASA doesn't really like stasers. It's not approved for flight missions yet. So that's great. Um, but like I mentioned, I'm showing you in this cartoon here that the tether will come, it'll deploy one dipole, it'll turn 90 degree, deploy another dipole and it'll go on. I want you all to uh, look at this uh, diagram carefully that we are not gonna have the same face center for the two orthogonal dipole. And that is something to think about and consider. So this is where my second question comes in, that what will the instrumental effects or the polarization leakage look like if we don't have the same phase centers? So I said polarization leakage. First, what is polarization? Just a quick recap. Uh, any electromagnetic wave always has polarization information associated with it. It tells us how the electric field of the electromagnetic wave is oriented. It's very important when you study certain sources in the sky. Uh, how do we measure this? We measure with it with certain parameters that we call as the Stokes parameters, where if Stokes parameter I means that the electric field is not oriented in any particular direction. With time, it'll just keep wailing around. Q and U are Stokes parameters that tell you the information that electric field will always be linear in time. It'll be straight or it'll be 90 degree or 45 degree, but always linear in time. The Stokes parameter V tells you that the electric field uh, rotates uh, in circles in time. 
and this is so important but it's because certain uh, radio waves uh, certain radio sources on the sky have this characteristics information and we, it gives us an insight into uh, certain properties of the source for example in far side we are trying to study the host star and the planet right and i told you both of them give us radio frequency emission in fact both of them tend to give us radio frequency emission roughly at the same frequencies how do we separate the signal we're going to get them combined we separate the signal using polarization information because the host the planet tends to have more circular polarization compared to the host star so using that additional information we can tell which signal is from the planet and which signal is from the host hence we need clean polarization data whereas any array any instrument always mixes these polarization information for us we have to calibrate it out in any array and in far side with the fact that we have shifted the phase centers of the two orthogonal dipoles there will be additional mixing so this has to be studied so that we can um, increase the efficiency of our side. So just to quickly understand uh, how these radio arrays um, uh, and how do we calibrate them. So I'm showing you here um, two, uh, two antenna nodes, um, antenna uh, one and antenna two. Both of them have orthogonal dipoles. They have the same phase center. Um, and this is, this is how we usually design radio waves, uh, radio arrays, so that we don't have complications. We don't shift the center so that we don't have complications. Now, if an electromagnetic wave from a source is coming in from the top right, it will hit uh, both the orthogonal dipoles of antenna two first, and then both the orthogonal dipoles of antenna one, right? So there is a delay. Right, so and we usually take this delay into account when we combine signals and study the source. Um, but the important thing is, it'll hit both the dipoles at the same time and both the dipoles here at the same time. In our far side case, it's a slightly more complicated, right? We now don't have the same phase center. I've just moved the uh, phase centers of one of the dipoles. So in addition to this original delay, we have an additional delay. And this has to be taken in account. This has to be taken in account when you when you try to figure out what the beam of the uh, array looks like and what the polarization information is going to look like. So let's see how that looks. So here I've carried out a simulation to estimate the eye of the array, uh, like I like to call it, or the beam, like what it's going to look in the sky. Uh, so this is the spiral layout, the new configuration. Um, I'm zooming in into the center and showing you another plot. Um, so the green dots are one of the uh, uh, dipole configurations and the black dots are the center of another dipole configuration. So they are offset. So it's the center of the two orthogonal dipoles offset. Um, when you do this, when you have this in an uh, array simulation, this is what the UV plane looks like. Like uh, for those of you who have seen a UV plane, this is what it will look like if I didn't offset the two. If I have the same center, this is what the UV plane looks like. The fact that I've offset the centers, my UV, UV plane looks slightly different. It looks uh, fine. Qualitatively, it looks slightly, but I can assure you that this slight difference will cause a lot of headache in our data. Uh, so we have to take into account not only one of this UV coverage, we have to take into account two different UV coverages. And showing you here is the beam. So it's like a uh, beam is usually three dimensional, you're right. But uh, I've just projected the beam on a flat surface. Um, so if there was no phase shift uh, of the centers, this is how the beam will look like. But the fact that we have shifted the centers, the beam looks slightly different. So um, we not only have to take into account one beam, now we have to take into account two beams for this configuration. And it's very important when we look for the source, when we look for a source, we have to remove the uh, characteristics of two different beams now. So that's in terms of the beams. What, what about in terms of the polarization leakage? I know it's a busy plot, but uh, you, as you can see, it's a quite a pretty plot. We can go over it one by one. So in this case, I am estimating the polarization. Okay, the polarization leakage. And I'm estimating for the normal case. That is, there's no shift. I've just placed the two uh, dipoles with the same phase center. Um, and in this plot, 
each of these circles represent the um, uh, top hemisphere on the sky. So the center of the circle is zenith and the uh, circumference of the circle is your horizon. So I'm showing you the upper hemisphere of the sky. Um, and the, these colors inside the plots are the leakages. So in row one, it's the eye polarization information from the sky going into I of the instrument, Q of the instrument, U of the instrument, V of the instrument. Similarly, the next one is Q of the sky going into four components. Next one is U of the sky going into four components, V of the sky going into four components. So in the ideal case, ideal case, this diagonal is what we want. That is, we want I of the sky to reach I of the instrument. We only want that. But the off diagonal elements are the leakages. So in an ideal case, we just want this diagonal elements to be populated and the off diagonal elements to be zero. But that never happens in any radio array. This is still the normal case. This is still like I've kept them with the same face center. In the, in the same face center, we already have leakage. We already have to take it into consideration in our processing, data processing pipeline. In far side, there's an additional complication. So uh, before that, let me highlight, uh, we are now gonna focus on these bottom four circles, okay, just so that the plot's not too crowded. Um, again, this is the bottom four plots when we only have been, again, it would have been nice if we only had these two and this was zero, but it's not. When I had the offsets and I convolved the two, if you see, my leakages just gets worse. So this is where I'm trying to stress that Stokes leakage does happen. And with Farsight, it happens worse. And it's so important to take into account. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to study the science cases clean. And the other few things to take into consideration, this has been modeled for one frequency. If I model for the entire frequency range of 100 kilohertz to uh, 40 megahertz, things get more complicated, but it has to be taken into account. Um, also, let me tell you that uh, uh, this has been simulated where the offsets between the dipoles are at a uh, given number. But when you actually make a mission or deploy these antennas, there will be certain uh, errors, right, in the deployments and the position of the antennas. All of that makes this leakage more complicated, which is where the study becomes so essential. So uh, far side layout has spatial offset between the dipoles. Uh, that affects the UV coverage, the beam, and the leakage, Stokes leakage. We have developed a pipeline to understand these uh, effects. Um, and we are going to use the pipeline to answer certain questions to JPL that what level in the error placements of this uh, dipoles can we tolerate? Like, you know, don't shift them more than one degree. If, if I'm asking for 90 degrees, don't make it more than 95 between the two. So we're going to answer that questions. We're going to test this FX on real sky models. Now, uh, I said far side. Uh, let's look at how much data the mission is producing. Uh, so far side is going to roughly uh, operate from 100 kilohertz to 40 megahertz. It's going to give us uh, data over 1,400 channels. Uh, we want uh, to look at the sky at every 60 seconds so that we don't miss any of the exoplanet events. That leads to about 65 GB of data per day. Uh, so that's a lot of data coming in per day. Um, and here is a quick. Um, uh, simulation of the sky, where you will see transient events uh, picked up by the array if you get information at every 60 seconds. So you see, this is how, this is how we expect so many transient events because of the exoplanets to occur. Oh yeah, now I have a question for you all. So we are on the far side of the moon. How do we relay data to uh, the Earth? Satellites, yep, satellites. Relay in orbit, Morse code, orbiting satellite, satellites, yep. Why an orbiting satellite? 
Yep, satellites. Yep. Okay. Relay orbits, satellites in orbit. You're absolutely right. Uh, so one of the thing is one of one such orbiting satellite that NASA themselves are working on is the Lunar Gateway. This comes as a part of the Artemis program that I told you NASA is interested in. So NASA is actually uh, working on a full fledged gateway that uh, will look at the far side 85 percent of the time and will look at the uh, will come in front of the near side and look at Earth 15 percent of the time. So this is like a support we can rely on. Um, uh, this are, these are proposed uh, data rays and the bands that we can use. These are proposed to NASA. Obviously, this is bound to change with time because a lunar gateway will not only support far side but will support different missions too. Also, uh, as a backup. Uh, Farsight is also working on uh, its own orbiting satellites via CubeSats. So there is a collaboration between Boulder, Caltech, and Virginia Tech. Uh, they are launching CubeSats. Um, the ground station is the Virginia Tech Conhubs, and the CubeSat is being flown over an array that we have used in the past, the Ovro LWA array. So we're testing these CubeSats and communicating information to the Virginia ground station. Um, and it could eventually become a support for Farsight. The other nice thing about this CubeSat is this CubeSat will become a calibration element for Farsight because one of the Farsight science cases is hydrogen cosmology, right? Uh, and uh, for that, we want our instruments to be calibrated to high accuracy. So we can fly this CubeSat over Farsight with a known antenna and we calibrate the elements of Farsight. So a CubeSat is being developed, one for communication, second for calibration also. Yeah. Uh, so some a little bit information about the timeline. Uh, so there are obviously different groups already researching on the science cases, hardware development. Uh, the launch date is expected to be 2028 for Farsight, uh, which will be a part of the phase two of uh, the uh, Artemis mission because phase one, like I told you, is going to be 2024. Uh, and with the phase one, we are already going to have the lunar gateway already powered up and a lot of proportional system has already been tested. Um, so in about from 2022, we're gonna start having uh, the phase A, B, C. These are uh, the general phase schemes of any NASA or JPL flight mission. So it's gonna have the primary design review first, then critical design review, then it'll have um, a system integration review and then testing and then deployment. So uh, 2028 will be deployment uh, um, or launched. Seven, it'll take about seven months for deployment because we saw the base station and the rover. And that plan, the array layout plan is for seven months. And after seven months, data would start coming and it'll be operation for about 60 months. We'll have data for 60 months. Uh, a quick summary about the cost of this mission. The total cost plus reserve is about $1.3 billion. Um, most of the cost does come in terms of the development and then uh, mostly from the operations and finally from the launch vehicle. So in terms of maturity level of the instrument, where are we at? How, how ready are we for space? Uh, so the electrically short dipoles have been flown before. So they are at TRL-8. So the TRLs go from one to nine, where nine is the actual mission. Uh, TRL-8 is it means it's already been tested in space. Uh, nodes are the antenna elements, the radiating heating element, the switching, uh, the, uh, the enclosure. All of that is at TRL-6. So it has been tested in a relevant, it has been tested in an environment similar to space, not actually flown in space, but similar to space. Um, the tether system, uh, which actually going, is going to contain our antennas and also uh, the fiber optic cables, the battery power cables. Uh, these are at TRL level four. So they have not been tested and demonstrated for space. They, they have been tested very well for the ground for sure. The correlator, which is where we're going to combine the signals, the electronics that combine the signals in your base station, uh, these are at TRL level four again, uh, because we have used correlators in radio arrays on the ground. Um, the only, it, this could go into TRL six very quickly because all we need to do is replace all of the components with um, space friendly or space safe component, flight safe components. Um, 
So I did say that the two profound questions are exoplanets and hydrogen cosmology, but uh, NASA is not going to just fund such a big mission if we don't have additional science. We have a lot of backup science one could do. Um, one is heliophysics. We can study our sun because like I said, the sun produces a lot of solar bursts at these radio frequencies. Uh, we can, um, I told you that we get radio frequencies from planets in our solar system so that we can study them in detail. Uh, we could also look for unknown large magnetized bodies in our solar system, maybe planet nine. Um, and if there are geomagnetic storms associated with planets, again, it's geomagnetic, it's associated with the magnetic storms, we're gonna have radio waves, we can see it. Um, the other interesting thing is at such low frequencies, we can study the interstellar medium much more in detail because we have never been able to go, go this low in frequency from the ground, right? So we have never been able to look at a three-dimensional view of the interstellar medium. Uh, so this becomes a possibility. The, my other fun, the fun uh, additional science that I like is the lunar uh, seismology or the moon quakes. So we do have a 10 kilometer long uh, array on the surface. And it's, it's gonna send signals from the rovers to uh, the base station via optical cables. If with a little bit more addition, if you have uh, seismometers associated with these optical ca cables, we could actually study lunar moon quakes, which hasn't been studied on the far side of the moon before. On the near side, the Apollo mission did study few particular areas, but nothing over 10 kilometer range, because now we have a big array on the moon. And then of course, um, SETI maybe, because uh, we're we are looking for uh, planets that have atmospheres, maybe we will see SETI. And then who knows, we're going to frequencies we have never seen before. So we might find more than what we expect. Um, finally, uh, I think Farsight is a very timely mission. Um, a lot of people, are, like a lot of different countries are now going to the moon. So it's time the US hits the moon. It's a radio array behind the moon at low frequencies. Uh, the increased interest is timely because lunar exploration has gained a lot of interest of late. Uh, the lunar gateway, which can, it's a big boon in terms of communication, is in place anyway with NASA. Um, NASA is also uh, co uh, collaborating with commercial lunar payloads. So we have capable landers to use and Artemis program is a blessing. Uh, the main science cases is exoplanet and the hydrogen cosmology. And right now, uh, all the collaboration is working on is sensor elements, the layouts, the electronics, mission architecture, the data processing, the relay satellites. So we're trying to answer all of this now. Uh, the launch is expected to be roughly 2028, and the data will come in six to seven months hence. Um, that's all I had, and I will take any questions. Wow, oh, fantastic talk, Nivedita. Thank um, you. So exciting. I'll, I'll bet a lot of people, um, including myself, didn't realize how far along some of these studies are. You know, it looks like we're getting serious about doing something on the moon. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Tom Curry has one question for you. Does mm -hmm. the antenna have a spatial optimal size or is it limited by the practical limitations of the mission deployment? Oh, that's, uh, that's actually a good question. So um, it's a little bit of the two, but we have decided that the antenna can be 100 meters long. Um, so it's actually a very long antenna. They didn't put a, a constraint on it because we're going to be embedding, embedding it in the tether. So it could be as long as po uh, possible. And if you have a longer antenna, you're, you're covering a much larger uh, collecting area. Um, so the constraint was if you have a long antenna, you have to keep them zigzagged because of the mission. And that's where there are problems and that's what I'm studying. And, and what, what was the distance that it was um, going to, the, the, the length of the spiral again? Uh, length of the spiral, roughly five kilometers. The total diameter of it's gonna be 10 to 11 kilometers, but one wow. spiral will be, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, looks like we have another question. Um, hiding on the far side shields you from terrestrial noise, but what about solar? Sun will Great question. Yeah. 
That's a great question. Uh, the plan for the main two key sciences is to do, do the observation only during lunar night. A lunar night is about 14 days, 14 Earth days. So uh, we will just observe during lunar night. Whereas we will do the additional science maybe during lunar day when we are in front of the sun. Yeah. Okay, okay. then Derek has a question. Let's see if we can get Derek to ask it. Go ahead, Derek. Can you um you should you should be live, Derek? Sorry, I was on mute myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah, how long do you think the um, we'll be able to collect data for? What's the longevity of the program? So uh, it actually the longevity that they have estimated is going to be 16 months, and it actually depends on the power sources we have. We are limited by the power source because um, during lunar nights we need nuclear power source and ra radioisotope heating elements, and uh, those lifespans is what limits us. So 16 months. Awesome, thank you. Okay, let me um. Like Rick, you should be able to ask your question. Rick Scott, that is. Okay, well, Rick, Rick is asking, has a landing location, but B has has it been identified that allow the rovers to drive the necessary distance? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the landing location, there are possible landing locations identified. One is, like I said, based on the attenuation we can get. Second, uh, people with more uh, lunar expertise are looking at areas where there is no undulations greater than one meter. Like it's because the, we don't want the rover in to run into up, obstacles greater than a meter, and we also don't want the array to be at at uh, uh, surface undulations greater than one meter. Yeah. The exact location is not identified, but this is the thought process they are having in terms of identifying a site. Okay, and Bharati, uh, you can ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, I'm just wondering about the sheer size of the array. I mean, how do you plan to squeeze it? How do you plan to mitigate if something goes, I don't know, one of the arms is disconnected? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's the reason the improved layout, layout is better. If one of the arms, one of the rovers fail, uh, we are constantly, the plan is to constantly communicate with the base station and the rover. If we realize one of the uh, rovers don't send out health signals back, uh, we're gonna change the angles between the spiral arms to become symmetric. If we have just three, we will make it 60 degrees each instead of 45 to make it symmetric, yeah. Do they plan for service mission, say, please? Are you gonna send service mission? Service oh, mission? Service <laughs> mission? If something Sorry. breaks, can somebody fix it? Uh, oh, if, if so, if one of the rover fails, we we are planning. I don't think we are planning that we might have an astronaut helping us there. But we're just playing. If one of the rovers just stop responding to us, we will just assume it's dead and work with three. Okay. okay, and Andrew, I think you're unmuted, so you can talk. You can ask your question. Go ahead, Andrew. You might be muted. I don't know. Okay. Well, Andrew's okay. Yeah, but I think I'm. I think I'm on now. Yes. Um. Our um, the red dwarf flares uh, and the interference pattern that they have with the magnetic field of the exoplanet is, is that is this the only way in which you can um, discover exoplanets with radio telescopes? I mean, if, if there was an extraterrestrial civilization, for instance, you'd never be able to really hear them because the the the, um, the radio noise of the star would completely drown it out. Am hmm. I right? 
Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, so the radio noise of the star and the emission from the exoplanet can be isolated by the polarization information. Um, and uh, in terms of radio emission, uh, exoplanet, uh, so I think uh, Tom had shown us an occ occultation uh, diagram, right, uh, with the asteroids before. That's another way people look at uh, exoplanets. But in terms of radio telescope, we definitely need magnetic fields. Um, and in terms of confusion with the host star, uh, we can separate it using polarization information. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, and um, Aswari, uh, you should be able to ask your question. What radioisotope are you planning to use for the far side mission to heat the surface? That is a good question. I was looking at the far side uh, decadal report. I don't work with those. I just know they're going to have radio, radio isotopes. Maybe I can get back to you on that. Sorry. OK. Yeah. OK, and then there's an anonymous um, question with dipoles that long. What, what are the resonance frequencies? Oh, that's a fair question. Uh, so it is 100 meters. Uh, so we are talking about at 100 meters, the lambda is about, so we go 303 megahertz and 1.5 megahertz is the resonant frequency. Yeah. So it's three meters is lambda by two. So 1.5 megahertz. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, I don't know if I see any other questions. Oh, um, let's see. Okay, yeah, we, we answered Rick's question. Any other questions? Okay, I think that covered just, all the questions. Sorry, just to answer Ishwari's question, uh, they mentioned in the technical report that they're going to use enhanced multi-mission radio isotope thermal electric generator. They don't actually give us the actual radio isotope element. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, seven, seven years to get this um, on the moon. <laughs> oh, well, just have to be patient. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks, Nivedita. I think I'll, oh, let's see, is there one more? One more Q&A, okay. Uh, Tom Curry put it in the, um, in the question. <laughs> thank you for a very interesting presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And so, Gordon, I'll turn the meeting back over to you. All right. Well, uh, Nivedita, thank you. Thank you for that that uh, very unique presentation and all the issues and uh, the uh, challenges and how you have uh, worked to overcome them. And, uh, you know, uh, that question and answer um, system that you had, well, that, that's, that's unique. That's the first time that we've had it on, the, on these meetings, and that made it fun. Oh, thank you. And, you know, amateur astronomers, we got into it because it's uh, fun, and you certainly have made this presentation fun. So, I'm glad. Thank, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you with that. And we hope to uh, have you on again, because obviously this is a new and fresh uh, um, uh, system and branch of science. So I'm sure that things will be coming up in the future that you could join us again. Please consider that. Yeah, I would be happy to. Thank you. Yeah, good. Great. Now, remember, uh, uh, everyone, that our next meeting is on uh, Friday, the 16th of April. And so plane wave, we'll have a plane wave presentation. And I'm sure you all kind of recognize that name on, on some large scale telescope sets available to the public. So uh, uh, that's all I have right now. Tom, anything? You I have. don't have anything to add. No, no, neither do I. So, hey, great. We had, it looked like 84 uh, participants who had fun answering those questions. I'm sure they did. And I will give the usual 
countdown, closing the meeting out. All right, so three, two, one. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.